blessed and most sacred privilege to be gathered with you all together today. I am especially honored that Pastor Moore and Lady Hope would invite me to just such a wonderful worship occasion. I must say to you all, I have not been in a live worship since February. And there's a great difference between being in the room and being God is able to bless through screens and Zoom, but I'm appreciative of the worship. The music ministry was awesome. I was especially blessed by the $30,000 check. I'm just excited. I want to thank the deacons and trustees and everybody else. That's a real blessing. And, um, you know, a, a, a woman and, and a man of this status uh, are worthy of the gifts they have received. And so I'm just blessed and privileged and just thank you all for having me to be a part. I gave some prayer to this message that uh, I would like to share. It is one of my favorite messages. Um, we're not ashamed as preachers that sometimes we preach messages over and over again because God does unusual things. Now, not through all of our messages, you know, I, I, but some are just anchored in us. And as I thought about 30 years and what Pastor uh, Moore and Lady Hope have meant to this church and this community and me coming in almost eight years ago as a member and just to receive and get a sense of how much they have meant to me, to the community, to our CTS community. I want to go to a text that is in the book of John in the first chapter, may even preach the sermon here, but it was what I felt God wanted to share with this congregation and this community on this 30th anniversary. The text says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the traditional King James Version reading of the text. I'll read it again. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I have a Eugene Peterson translation called The Message that I hope that you're familiar with. And it translates this text in this way. And the word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And we saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. I want to preach something entitled, And God Moved Into the Neighborhood. Would you just bow with me in a word of prayer? God, now we do thank you and just bless you for the beauty of worship, whether gathered or yet across screens and computer terminals and internet. God, we thank you that you're still God, that you touch and reach. Bless now the word that it goes forth, that it may touch hearts and lives and homes. We thank you for 30 years of service and ministry and dedication, being true from start to finish, being generous from inside and out. We bless them and we thank you for them now. In Jesus' name, amen. I love this traditional translation of this text from 1 John 1 and 14, and we know it from Sunday school and from many, many, many kinds of Bible teachings, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. I love that translation, but also in the message, it jumped off the page. It said, and the word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. The word neighborhood leaped out at me. Neighborhood reminds me of the magnificent place and the wonderful people who I grew up with in the neighborhood. I remember in the neighborhood, we had uh, a street corner where we played baseball. There were four sewers. One sewer was first base. Another sewer was second base. There was a third base sewer and a home plate in the neighborhood. 
I remember the playground in the neighborhood, what seemed like millions and millions of kids on the playground. I remember basketball tournaments during the summer where we won two championships in the neighborhood. I remember wonderful people in the neighborhood like Mr. Brown and Mr. Shavers. We didn't have money for baseball uniforms. They bought the uniforms out of their own pockets, piled us up in an old beat up state wagon and drove us to each and every baseball game in the neighborhood. I really wasn't that good at baseball in the neighborhood. I could play basketball, but no, nobody really chose me when it came time to play baseball. Well, the day came, they only had eight people, so they came and got me, put a uniform on me, and put me out in right field. In those days, you know, you put your worst player out in right field because the ball typically does not come out there very often, so they stuck duck me out there, put a glove on me. I'm standing out there praying to God that the ball would not come in my direction. I, I mean, it, I just, God, please, in the name of Jesus, I declare it. It ain't coming out here. Well, all of a sudden, off the edge of the bat, the ball came out to me, and I froze. I got stuck. I froze. The ball went over my head. The center fielder went and picked the ball up. The guy ran all around the base and had a home run. I still hadn't moved. I mean, I absolutely froze. I mean, uh, and all of a sudden, the team, they were screaming, why didn't you get it? Why? Oh, and the tears began to flow, I remember. I remember I hoped that the inning would never be over, so I'd have to go back to the bench and look at the players. Well, as I headed back to the bench, Mr. Shavers met me at the pitcher's mound. He picked my little chin up off the ground and said to me, you'll catch the next one. All right. That meant the world to me. You mean I'm still part of the team? I mean, it meant so much to screw up and still be a part, that I belonged in the neighborhood. It meant so much. I was so proud, finally, that I belonged He in the neighborhood. I don't know if I'd be standing in front of you now doing what I do without Mr. Shavers saying to me in the neighborhood, you'll catch the next one. I remember block parties. I don't know if y'all know anything about block parties where all the neighbors, they blocked the streets off at both ends and all the neighbors would sit out and party together and I, we would just have fun together in the neighborhood. I remember the neighborhood. I remember uh, you know, the girl across the street. I, I, I remember the day that I realized that she was a girl and I was a boy. I mean, I really, I, I remember that day. I figured out there was something different about her and there was something different about me and that what she had attracted me in the neighborhood. As Mr. Rogers says, it was a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I bet you had a neighborhood too. And there were some beautiful days in your neighborhood. In light of my remembrance of such beautiful days, I wonder what's going on in the neighborhood now. I make visits back to the neighborhood. I realize that even though nostalgia sets in and everything was not all flowers and roses then, but it has gotten much worse now in the neighborhood. We have things like four young men hijack a car and then shoot the man in the face after he even surrendered the car in the neighborhood. It used to be they would rough you up a little bit and, uh, you know, there was a potential for violence, but basically you had a good chance to live now. Lives every day are at risk in the neighborhood. Drugs and crimes and gangs and guns and rape and violence. What in the world is going on in the neighborhood? And some of us have moved out of the neighborhood and gone to the beautiful areas and now the nice neighborhoods. And not only have some of us left and people left, but also good goods and services and health care and economic development and money and bank and decent insurance rates and quality schools and grocery stores and businesses and concerns by many politicians have all moved to the nice neighborhoods. Ah, so much inequality in the neighborhood. You know, they have these books where you can visit a city. You know, if you're a tourist and you come in, you can, you, can, they, you can buy a book. And they found a way to tell visitors what neighborhoods are dangerous. What neighborhoods it's not safe to be in, day or night. It's meant to protect the tourists or the visitors to, to, to the city. And you know what? You know what? I got my hands on one of them, and my neighborhood was marked as not a safe place. 
it's not so beautiful a day in the neighborhood because of what's going on in the neighborhood. It gives me great hope when this text says, and the word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. You mean the word was made flesh and moved into the unsafe place, the neighborhood. You mean the word was made flesh and moved into places of inequality, of gang activity, crime, violence, teenage childbearing, high dropout rates poor community health, joblessness, homelessness, and blight. You mean that the places that are the result of short-sighted policies by uh, politicians, <laughs> intentional efforts to racialize and segregate communities, the word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. I can understand that the word is needed everywhere, and so he also moves up to the Gold Coast and the wonderful and beautiful suburban areas. Yes, he's needed there in the rich and the prosperous areas, but I'm so thankful that he moves into my neighborhood with the poor folks, with the immigrant, with the homeless, the disabled. He moves into public housing. He makes his home amongst drug dealers and crack houses. He lives with pimps and prostitutes. He moves in with the poor of heart and the broken of spirit, the sick, the lonely, the bereaved, the caregiver caring for somebody with Alzheimer's and a parent with dementia. He moves in that neighborhood. The word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Now, by all rights and privileges, he should have moved into the Taj Mahal or at least the White House. He should have moved into the most wonderful seven-star hotel uh, that the world has to offer, like that beautiful one in Dubai that looks like a sail. I mean, the Burj Al Arab is called. He should have had the penthouse at the top of the Burj Al Arab. He should have the Grand Canyon as his backyard and Niagara Falls as his jacuzzi. He should have all of that, but he moved into the neighborhood. You, you, remember, you remember the Greek word for uh, word is logos and the word and the logos, the word moved, you remember it, it moved into the neighborhood. In the Greek, it ordinarily refers to the spoken word. Uh, with the emphasis being on the meaning conveyed and not just the sound. Where I grew up in the neighborhood, we used to quote James Brown, talking loud and saying nothing. That God's word, God's logos, when God speaks, when the word moves into the neighborhood, it's not just talking loud, it's saying something. It's conveying power and the expression of God's personality, authority, and action in the communication and the presence of the word and the word was made flesh. The word is pre-existent with God. You remember in the beginning, John 1 and 1 was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things that were made were made. Nothing that was made, was, it wasn't made without him. The word spoke and worlds came to be. God said, let there be light. It was an expression of God's personality, God's authority, God's action. And guess what? When God said, let there be light, there was light. The world and everything was created through the word of God. Psalm 33 says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry hosts, by the breath of his mouth, he gathers the waters of the seas into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses, for he spoke and it came to be. The word of God, the expression of God has creative power and called the universe into being. The word of God is the source of all that is visible and antedates the totality of the material word. This word, this cosmic and creative word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. The word was made flesh, pulled up a moving van and moved into the neighborhood. We saw him when he moved in, and we were all curious about him. You, you, you know how we all get curious about neighbors when we get new neighbors, and 
when they move in, when we see the moving truck, you know, we want to know who are they and know a little bit. We, we got to know him. When we got to know him, when we got to know him, he had a kind of glory, a kind of one of a kind kind of glory. We, we, didn't, we didn't know what it was. We didn't know. But what we noticed is that when sick people came to his house, they left their well. All we could say, it was something like God was living in the neighborhood. You know old crazy Frank, everybody, everybody knows he was a little bit off. Word was he had some bad spirits in him. And you know what? When crazy Frank went up there, he came out one evening clothed in his right mind. Mrs. Johnson had medical problems, spent everything she had trying to get well, had been sick for 38 years, said something was wrong with her blood. You know what? He fixed some food. She came down there, told her she was down to her last dime. He took it all over, and she left there not bleeding anymore. There was something different about him, something that stood out, something that made him shine, an old preacher said. It was the glory. The old preacher said, beams of divine glory darted through the veil of his human flesh. He was the brightness of God's glory. We had the brightness of God's glory in the neighborhood. We saw it. We beheld it like father, like son, a one of a kind glory. The preacher one day in the neighborhood took a text in John 1:14 and talked to us about the word being made flesh and dwelt among us that the word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. In the King James Version, it says, and the word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood full of grace. Eugene Peterson translates this term full of grace, generous inside and out. He was generous from the center of himself, inside and out. He was not generous trying to impress someone, not generous trying to be political, not generous for what he could get. Not generous based upon who would see him giving his offering. I mean, generous from the center of himself. Spirit without measure. Compassion without complaint. Generous. Everybody was welcome. Gay people were welcome. Straight people were welcome. Transgender people were welcome. Republicans were welcome. Democrats were welcome. Convicts, criminals, drug addicts, drug dealers, presidents, governors, senators. The millionaire or the person on welfare was welcome. He was generous inside and out. The King James Version says it was full, uh, you know, uh, uh, full of truth, uh, uh, um, you know, full of grace and full of truth. Eugene Peterson translates that true from start to finish. He didn't start off doing good and when nobody is looking, get sneaky. He was true from start to finish. True the first day you gave him the job, and true 30 years later as pastor and first lady. True. True the day you married him, and true the day you look over him in a casket as it goes down and descends into the ground. True. True like the mama who is true to the child even before the, mo the moment of conception and is still true till the day she calls the children and the grandchildren in the room and tells them it's time for mama to go home now to a place not made with human hands. Most of us are true when we think somebody's looking. But if we could get away with it because ain't nobody looking, ain't nobody going to catch us, we would do it. But he was true from start to finish. He did not lie. He did not spin. Did not have alternative facts. He was true from start to finish. 
One more question before I head to my seat as I'm almost out of here. One more. We all wondered what brought him to the neighborhood. I mean, what, what, what would bring him? To, he had all the neighborhoods he could have lived in. What, what brought him to the neighborhood? Some of us are impressed with the power of Almighty God, that God would bring something out of nothing. God would bring worlds to be by just speaking. Others are impressed with God's omnipotence. They're impressed with the fact that God knows everything and all at the same time. Yeah. What I'm impressed with is God's love. It's God's love that brings him to the neighborhood. It's God's compassion that allows Jesus to give up his privileges in glory and move into the neighborhood. Love brings him into the neighborhood. A story is told of Ray Kroc who started the McDonald's franchises in Chicago. He had the habit of touring and inspecting uh, on, on a surprise basis uh, McDonald's restaurants around the city to ensure that they would adhere to the strictest standards of cleanliness and professionalism. With no advance warning at all, Ray Kroc would show up at a McDonald's and do an inspection. He paid a visit to a McDonald's restaurant in one of those neighborhoods that are abandoned with few jobs and few businesses. He pulled up and looked out of the window of his tenant black stretch limousine and saw paper and garbage all around the store on the ground. Ray Kroc asked the driver to stop the car, got out of his stretch limousine, picked up the paper, cleaned the parking lot. Ray Kroc, the owner of McDonald's, cleaned up a parking lot himself and got back into his stretch limousine. He was not arrogant. He was not prideful. He could have called somebody. He could have sent somebody. He could have ordered the limo driver to pick it up. He could have gotten the cell phone number to the owner of the store and called the cell phone and said, owner, owner of the store said, get out here and get this mess picked up instantly could have asked the store manager but because he loved McDonald's he did it himself love brought him to the neighborhood he did it himself Ray Kroc reminds me of Jesus the word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood Jesus cruises our human neighborhoods and he sees people because of sin and degradation are considered refuse and trash people that have no dignity or worth that anybody is bound to respect Jesus cruises neighborhoods and sees you and me out there on the parking lot of life looking and feeling like trash Jesus could have called somebody Jesus could have called legions of angels to clean us up Jesus could have formed a committee Jesus could have after the resolution, but no, he stepped out of bright glory and marched his way to a hill called Calvary and gave his own life to clean us up. He didn't send anybody. He didn't order anybody. He showed up in the neighborhood, as Philippians 4 and 2 says, who being in the very nature of God, did not account equality with God to be held on to, but gave it up, making himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being born in human likeness, being found in the neighborhood as a human being. He humbled himself by becoming obedient, even death on the cross. Oh, I'm so glad that God moved into the neighborhood. The word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And because the word is in the neighborhood, the old preacher used to say, it's all right now. Everything is all right because the word is in the neighborhood. As I was thinking about this, I drive by this church uh, going to, to, to work. You know, well, I don't go much now because of the you know, pandemic, but when I used to, every day, I would drive by New Era Church. I would drive by, and I would be so thankful that Pastor Clarence Moore and Sister Hope Moore, that they moved into this neighborhood. Can you bless me and join me and bless God that Pastor Clarence Moore 
Moore and Lady Hope moved into this neighborhood full of grace and truth, true from start to finish, generous from inside and out, that pastor moved into this, out of all the neighborhoods where he could have gone, all the churches he could have been a pastor at, he's a pastor in this neighborhood. Can you bless God that New Era Church moved into the neighborhood, did not run out into the suburbs, into the beautiful neighborhoods, but stayed right here in the hood, in the neighborhood. If Pastor Moore had not moved into the neighborhood, you would not have had Operation uh, Moore Hope. I got, the, I got the, what that meant this morning about 2 a.m. Oh, yes. Lady Hope, Pastor Moore, Moore Hope. It hit me about 2 o'clock this morning. That, that kids that, that, that trans would be transformed, that a place that the clan used to hang out could be redeemed and used for God's purposes in the neighborhood. That kids that were failing in school, if they hadn't moved into this neighborhood, yeah. this church would have never heard of nothing wrong with the seed. The problem is the soil. Nothing is wrong with the seed. The problem is the inner city, the blighted neighborhood, the food desert, the high crime. We beheld his glory, the one-of-a-kind glory. Like father, like son, generous inside and out. True from start to finish. I'm thankful that you both are in this neighborhood. You've been generous to me inside and out. You've been true from start to finish. And you know what? Because Pastor Moore and Lady Hope are in the neighborhood. We can join Mr. Rogers and say, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> this 30th anniversary is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. I, I want, to, uh, I want to, to close with a word of prayer and some kind of a way to invite somebody. I don't know if you're looking for a church home, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, uh, you don't, probably don't know much about me, but years ago, several years ago, I retired from, from being a pastor. And, Eight years ago, and I'd been a pastor for 31 years of my life, and so my daughter said to me when, when, when I retired, she said, Daddy, I got to find a pastor. You've been my pastor my whole life. She said, I know what you made of. I know you true from start to finish. I know you generous inside and out, but there's some sharks out here. And she's right. <laughs> there are some sharks. But I want to commend to somebody that may be looking for a church home. Pastor Clarence Moore and Lady Hope. If my daughter lived in Indianapolis, I could recommend New Era Church, Pastor Moore and Lady Hope, because these folks ain't sharks. They're true from start to finish. They're generous inside and out. And because of that, I know, I know, you've, I, you, maybe you just tuned in accidentally. I don't know, but God has purposes and plans. If you're tuned in, I want to pray both for the gathered community. I want to pray for somebody who might be looking for a church home. I want to pray for somebody that don't have a relationship that Jesus will move into your neighborhood. Jesus will move into your heart and change your life as he's changed mine, as he's changed ours, as he's changed all of our lives. So would you just bow with me in a word of prayer? God, now we are just so thankful for that the word was made flesh and moved into the neighborhood. God, that you find us at the level of where we are and you meet us and minister and touch. I thank you for the ministry of New Era Church. I thank you for Pastor Clarence Moore and Lady Hope. I thank you and I bless you for their ministry. And God, if anybody's looking for a church home, anybody that doesn't know Jesus, this is a time and a place. This is the church and a pastor and a first lady that will be true from start to finish. 
to be generous inside and out. May this touch somebody's heart to come and be a part of New Era. New Era family, we bless you today. Thank you for your generosity of love and gifts. Thank you for following this man and woman of God. Thank you so much for being in the neighborhood. Now, God, thank you. We're grateful and thankful. It's in the name of Jesus who found me, a little snot-nosed kid on the south side of Chicago in a neighborhood that a whole lot of people didn't want to live in, but he found me and made my life into something. And I'm so grateful. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. And amen.